<laughs> Rob Arnold is one of our distance students, uh, probably the distance student to get the most press so far. Um, he actually is the head distiller at uh, what was Firestone Robertson, now is TX Whiskey. Um, he's been there for, oh, probably close to a decade now and started with me here as a graduate student when he was searching for someone to work with him on developing a corn for Texas whiskey that could be produced in Texas that would capture the terroir. terroir. Uh, Rob has actually published two books, uh, Shots of Knowledge, which you can look up on Amazon, and his most recent book, which I'm still only through chapter four on right now, Rob, uh, <laughs> which is uh, on the terroir of whiskey, which was published by Columbia University Press um, and just released in the last couple of weeks. Rob finished his defense. Rob turned in his dissertation. So I think this is his last requirement for graduate school. Uh, been a real pleasure having Rob, and I might put a couple things in the chat if you want to learn more about his whiskey work that he doesn't talk about today. So, Rob, good luck. Thanks. All right, let's see if this spotty Wi-Fi and my VPN is going to hold up. Um, let me... Okay, you all seen and hearing that? We got it, hearing... and we hear it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Seth. So... I am excited to present what I've worked on over the past couple of years since 2016 when I joined the program. Um, I am a whiskey distiller and my research has focused on a very specific part of our process, which is the grain, which is the base for making whiskey, but more, more specifically how this this effect called terroir, which really is not that mysterious, although the industry tries to make it. Um, how terroir impacts the flavor of whiskey um, and how we can potentially leverage that to select for varieties that are tailored for whiskey making. Um, quick background on me. I'm the master distiller for TX. Like Seth said, I'm also the head of sustainable agriculture initiatives for our parent company, Pernod Ricard here in North America. Um, not from Texas. I'm, I was born in Kentucky. My family has been a part of the bourbon industry for a a handful of generations now. And my background is in a bachelor's degree in microbiology. And then I came to Texas back in 2009 to do a PhD program in biochemistry at UT Southwestern Medical Center. I left early with my master's degree to join TX. Um, surprisingly for most people, maybe my, uh, my parents were not too shocked or upset when I told them I was leaving school to go make alcohol. Um, like I said, it's in my family. Um, but I always knew I wanted to get back into science and try to complete a PhD in this distance PhD program. It couldn't have been more perfect. Um, I, say, I say that if Seth wasn't there and didn't have an interest in this, it might not have worked out because I was not a typical PhD plant breeding candidate, but um, it's been an amazing experience. Uh, if you're ever in Fort Worth, please come see us. This is our distillery. We're one of the largest whiskey distilleries in the United States. Um, drop me an email or just call up to our front desk and say, you saw Rob give his presentation and he promised to show you or your friends and family around. And I, if I'm, if I'm around, I will be more than happy to take you on a, a tour of the distillery. Quick overview of how whiskey's made. Um, it's really a pretty simple process. There's five stages to it. Uh, first, we're going to mill grain, uh, raw kernels. Uh, we're gonna turn that grain into grist through milling. So grist, you know, it's just like a coarse flour. That grist will then be added to water and um, in stage two in the mashing process. And we, uh, we apply steam, direct steam injection for cooking. And that cooking process breaks down the starch and the sugar. So gelatinization of the starch and then enzymes present in um, the malted barley component of the recipe will break down that starch into sugars. And at the same time, flavor is going to be extracted at this stage. So uh, through thermal degradation of grain components um, uh, and then extract, then extracting those degradation products, then they will serve either as flavor compounds themselves or more typically as precursors to flavor compounds. So that mash is now a very sweet, sugary, um, nutrient dense um, substance. Our mashes are, our fermentations are 16,000 gallons each. So we've got a 16,000 gallons of a sugary mash. We then add our yeast. We have a proprietary wild Texas yeast strain that we use to make all of our whiskey. The yeast will eat the sugar, make alcohol, 
as a byproduct, but the, it also will make uh, a host of different flavor compounds as byproducts as well. Um, whether it's through sugar metabolism or other nutrients like amino acids and fatty acids that are present in the mash. Stage four, that beer is distilled into new make whiskey. Uh, new make whiskey is as clear as vodka, um, but it has a lot of flavor still present. And I don't mean that as a way to kind of knock vodka, but vodka purposefully is distilled to a, a very high proof to where it's essentially neutral. Whereas whiskey will be distilled to a much lower proof and proof is just double ABV distilled to a much lower proof to maintain flavor, um, a lot of flavor in that new make. So it's as clear as vodka, but it has a lot of flavor compared to vodka. That new make whiskey is then put into a, an oak barrel. And that is where all the color is picked up through extraction, but also a lot of the flavor comes from the oak barrel. So the whiskey will extract flavor compounds out of the oak. And then over the course of maturation, which can take anywhere from two, three, four, five, 10, 15 years during that maturation period, you have a lot of reactions occurring among flavor compounds that came from the mash or from the beer um, or from the oak barrel. So what is terroir or terroir? Um, how we would, a lot of people here in the you know, English speaking countries would say it. Um, it's, it's not that complicated. It, it's, it's a romantic synonym for um, the effects that we think about all the time, the genetic effect, the environment effect, and the interaction of those two. That is, that is terroir. Um, so it's essentially saying how those effects in grapes or grains, if we're talking about wine, beer, and whiskey, how those effects in grapes and grains can impact the flavor of wine or whiskey or beer as well. And the wine industry has studied this a lot, and they know things. Uh, they've studied how air temperature, um, sunlight, nitrogen status in the soil, uh, irrigation, water availability, water status, how those, how those aspects impact the eventual flavor chemistry and therefore the flavor of wine. Now it hasn't been studied uh, to any degree essentially in whiskey until um, this dissertation. And, um, and in most places it hasn't been studied that well, but the wine industry luckily has provided us with a great, um, a great framework. That said, um, it's a debated topic in our industry um, and has been for a very long time. And there's been a lot of publications, especially recently um, in the media, asking the questions of, does it matter? Does terroir matter for whiskey? Um, you know, it's, it's essentially the foundation of wine. You know, people choose wine in so many ways based on terroir. You know, you don't, when you go and buy a bottle of wine, you're probably thinking, well, I want a Chardonnay or a Merlot. Those are varieties of the grapes, right? Or I want a, a wine from Napa Valley or from Sonoma or Bordeaux. Uh, it's just a, just a very different way than we would walk into a store and buy a bottle of whiskey, which is usually based on the brand. So how would this work? How would terroir impact flavor in whiskey? You essentially have um, six metabolites in grain that are going to serve as precursors typically to flavor compounds. Um, you have some primary metabolites, sugar, amino acids, and fatty acids. You have some secondary metabolites, um, cinnamic acids, the building blocks of lignin and lignan carotenoids and pyrazines. And those metabolites could be influenced by G, E or G by E. Um, so their concentration and composition could be influenced and that will then potentially impact the concentration and composition of their, of the flavor compounds and whiskey that are derived from those metabolites in the grain. That said, it's been ignored in the industry for at least the last hundred years. Um, and I think the two main reasons for this really come down to the commodity grain system and then um, breeding intensely for yield. Uh, commodity grain, by, by definition, you essentially cannot specify what variety or uh, what farm the, the grain came from. Um, exceptions obviously are there, but in general, a distiller, especially the big heritage brands in Kentucky and Tennessee, you know, the, they don't get more specific than saying that they want um, a truckload of yellow dent corn, at least number two grade. It's like a winemaker saying, um, well, I want red grapes to make my wine. Of course, it's not how a winemaker approaches grape selection, but um, the commodity grain system has provided us uh, for a long time now with the consistent supply of grain, but it, it has not allowed us to specify um, 
or dive into what can happen if you want to look at varieties of corn or other grain types um, or how the, or what farms they came from. And then breeding for yield as well. I mean, a pro, you know, prohibition here in the U.S. ended right around the time we introduced um, hybrids and, and um, really started to see this, this massive push towards breeding for yield. And there's evidence uh, in other plants that when you breed for yield, you inadvertently lose flavor along the way. So they've showed in tomatoes, uh, Harry's, Harry Clee's lab at the University of Florida has shown that um, of 20 20 plus genes involved in making important flavor compounds in tomatoes are modern high yielding varieties um, have less uh, you know, deficient forms of those genes and therefore produce less of the flavor compounds in tomatoes that um, than like heirlooms, for example. And then anecdotally in corn, you know, especially in the past five to 10 years, a lot of celebrity chefs have begun to really champion old heirloom varieties of corn, prizing them for their flavor. Um, so I think that it's safe to say that our modern yellow dent hybrids are less flavorful um, than what potentially is available within the species at large um, for corn. Um, but in the end, this would take money and logistical endeavors for a distillery to specify variety and specify farm um, origin. And there's really not, there's just not, have, there's been nothing out there published to, to, to put some definitive um, science behind, yeah, terroir does impact the flavor of whiskey or alcohol yield um, and therefore should be a consideration. And so that's where my dissertation started. So phase one was asking a couple of basic questions. Does terroir impact whiskey? If so, is it a meaningful impact in bourbon that's produced from elite yellow hybrids? Because in the end, um, at least for now, that's still going to be the main source of corn to the, the bourbon industry, um, yellow dent hybrid corn. And then if it does impact whiskey, how can we leverage that? Uh, the first phase of my research was published in 2019 in PLOS One. Um, we're looking at uh, you know, assessing the terroir effect on alcohol yield and flavor um, in elite yellow hybrid corn grown in Texas. So we did just deal with corn grown here in Texas. Um, my PhD was funded by uh, TX Whiskey. We only use Texas corn, so that was that was part of the process. Um, what we did is we took, uh, or really in the Texas corn performance trials, identified um, three elite hybrids grown on three locations throughout Texas. Um, in the Panhandle and Hill County where Sawyer Farms is, Sawyer Farms is the farm that supplies all of the grain to TX Whiskey. Um, on this map, FNR is TX. Um, that's where our distillery is. So Hill County, Sawyer Farms is very close to our distillery. And then also down on the Gulf Coast in Calhoun County. And then one of the varieties was also grown on, um, down, in, um, down in Hidalgo County. So ultimately that's 10 samples of corn. And then in the lab took those samples and processed them in triplicate. And so I had 30 mashes, 30 beers, 30 distillations, and eventually 30 new make bourbons. Um, here's just some pictures of the setup. Uh, it's pretty basic microbiology and chemistry equipment, but it did allow me to maintain consistency in the process so that I didn't have, uh, or at least do my best to minimize experimental error. Uh, we performed a, a handful of quantitative analyses for the PLOS One paper. I'm not going to go into it all today based on time, but um, we'll focus on something, uh, a couple uh, aspects specifically, starting with terroir's effect on ethanol yield. So we tracked it from the grain to the mash to the beer and finally to the new make whiskey. And what we saw was that the interaction was responsible for most of the variation um, in uh, total starch content in the milled corn. Um, less so, but still a uh, majority of the variation was due to the interaction for total sugar in the mash. Um, then after fermentation, total ethanol in the beer, we saw the variation shift to the environment and genetic effects and that um, stayed true with ethanol yield. And that's what we really care about, okay? Ethanol yield is how much ethanol you actually get after distillation. That's how we track yield in our industry. Um, obviously these other aspects, starting with starch and then sugar and then the ethanol actually in the beer after fermentation are important, but what matters is how much you actually yield after distillation. 
um, these findings were interesting and, and meaningful for the industry. Um, we showed that for the lowest yielding uh, ethanol yielding, not agronomic, lowest ethanol yielding variety farm combination, variety farm sample, I would have to buy 17% more of that corn if I wanted to match the highest ethanol yielding variety farm combination. Um, so if we're going to incorporate this into a breeding program and, and try to select for varieties with increased ethanol yield, um, we need, we uh, ideally need a, a marker that's not in the actual new make stage, because that's a very low throughput process to turn grain into new make, even in the lab. Um, we found though that uh, this is what I think what I'm showing here in the red box here is what I think is the most promising is that total sugar in the mash uh, significantly correlated with ethanol yield in the new make. And that's a promising finding because total sugar in mash is routinely measured in our industry, very basic, not very and very uh, cheap HPLC methods. And um, by looking at sugar in the mash, you don't confound the uh by, you're not confounded by yeast strain selection because different yeast strains also can impact how much ethanol you're going to make um so shifting now to terroir's effect on flavor um showing percent of total variation here um and what uh what we found was that of 46 aromas and the new make bourbons that we looked at and um, Ali Ochoa was a master student at the time who we actually hired when she graduated, but Ali trained a sensory panel to conduct um, a very thorough sensory technique known as spectrum analysis, where they would smell a sample of bourbon and then rate the intensity from zero, not present to 15, extremely present for 46 different aromas in, that, in the new make bourbon sample. And what I'm showing you here are the 13 of the 46 that were meaningfully impacted by terroir. And we, we said that meaningfully impacted meant that the air was not responsible for more than 80% of the variation. Um, so a lot of these are very important flavors in, in whiskey, uh, corn, sweet, sour. There's, you know, there's some bad ones here too that we need to take into account. You know, we don't want stale and sour flavors in our whiskey, but we do want sweet, corn, malty, molasses flavors. So um, we, uh, we, that was the sensory data. Now we also in the new make whiskey did flavor chemistry analysis. So here are, um, well, what we did is we identified through GC mass spec coupled to olfactometry. Uh, again, Ali executed this stuff beautifully and um, olfactometry incorporation meant that we were only looking at flavor compounds that registered an aroma event during the GC mass spec process. So literally Ali would sit at the machine, inject a sample of new make, and we might detect a compound, but unless Ali could smell it through the olfactometry port at the time of the event registration, uh, it wouldn't be considered. So only compounds that we were concerned about were those that actually had a smell to them um, during the analysis. And we identified 68 flavor compounds that registered this uh, an aroma event during GC mass spec. I'm showing you a table of 36 here that again, were meaningfully impacted by terroir. So at least or 80% or less of the variation um, due to air. And the ones that are in red boxes are uh, from a literature review that I, I conducted uh, and that we had published. These are compounds that have been previously shown through even more sophisticated techniques um, of, of chemical and sensory analysis to impact the flavor of bourbon. So the ones in red boxes we know are critical for the flavor of, of um, bourbon. An interesting finding here as well, 50% of these compounds, this table of 36, 50% of these are esters. Okay, now grain and grapes make esters, but they're not there in high enough concentration to impact wine or whiskey. Esters are incredibly important in the, for the flavor of wine and whiskey, but they're coming from yeast fermentation. So what's this telling me is that, okay, yeah, these esters are not actually from the grain directly, but they're indirectly coming from grain precursors, grain nutrients through yeast fermentation. So it's just expanding the role. Terroir is not just about grain derived products directly. It's also about how it can impact yeast fermentation. Um, this literature review was published not in a journal, but in my new book, The Terroir of Whiskey. Um, and it's only a, a few chapters of the book. Um, Seth, you're not, you're not to them yet, but um, 
Uh, this, this review looked at a handful of different sources, identified the most important flavor compounds in whiskey, and then looked at the wine research and said, okay, which of these important flavor compounds uh, in whiskey are also found in wine and also impacted by terroir in wine? And what I found was that almost all of the important flavor compounds in whiskey are not just also found in wine, but they're impacted by some aspect of terroir in wine. Um, so this is my plug for my book. It's available on Amazon or your local bookstore. And uh, if you like to listen versus read, it just came out on Audible a few days ago. And uh, okay, back away from the, the book plug. Okay, so the, the next step was I wanted to see, again, just like I wanted to find markers to select for ethanol yield, wanted to see if we could find markers to select for flavor. Um, I simplified the sensory data. I'm not going to go into how I did it, but Essentially, each replicate had only two sensory values when I did this analysis, a good value, so good aromas, and a bad value, bad aromas. Um, and what I found was that there were six flavor compounds that positively correlated with the good aroma values. Um, and that one compound positively, cor positively correlated with the bad aroma value. And um, this is what I would expect to see in a lot of ways. 2-nona now is the compound that showed correlation with the bad value. 2-nona now is a known bad compound. It's a known troublemaker. It's stale. It's cardboard. You don't want this compound in your whiskey at elevated levels. The ones that correlated with the good, uh, we got a handful of esters there. We've got an aldehyde nona now, which is a nice citrusy flavor. Um, we've got styrene, which is a, well, it's a, well, it's a, it's a um, kind of a sweet phenolic flavor. Um, so we're, you know, this is good, but in the end, like, like I said it earlier, you know, this is still drawing correlations in the new make stage. And that's not ideal due to how low throughput it is to turn corn into new make whiskey. So we wanted to step further and there's a lot more data in the paper, but we also did GC mass spec on the milled corn itself to analyze volatiles. And what we saw was that benzaldehyde concentration in corn um, pos positively correlated with these four important flavor compounds right here. And again, these four that I'm showing you are just from this table as well. These four correlate with good aroma notes in new make whiskey. Um, so just to, one more time, and I'll probably say it again, um, we need markers in the, at the grain, the mash, or the beer stage. It's just not practical at the new make stage. Um, you know, it took me months to do 30 samples. Uh, it's, you know, unless you have someone do even if you have someone doing this full time, it's just, it's just too low throughput to fit into a breeding program, in my opinion. Um, so phase one questions, does terroir impact whiskey? Uh, yes, this was the first report to provide experimental evidence that it does. Uh, and a paper just came out a few weeks ago uh, in Oregon State um, was part of this paper that showed similar results in malt whiskey. Remember, we were looking at new make bourbon whiskey. They looked at new make malt whiskey. Uh, is it meaningful in bourbon that's made from elite yellow hybrids? Uh, I'd say yes. And, you know, there was no definitive direction on the importance of GE or G by E, but they're definitely playing a role in driving alcohol yield and flavor variation. How can we leverage it? I think total sugar and mash is a great metabolite marker for um, ethanol yield selection. And benzaldehyde is a promising um, marker in corn for um, looking for flavor selection. So taking this further and, and how, you know, setting a course for selection, um, you go back to the metabolites that we have in, in grain. We have the primary metabolites, so sugar, amino acids, and fatty acids. They serve as precursors to all these flavor compounds I'm showing you on the right side of the arrow from long chain alcohols to esters, aldehydes, ketones, lactones. Um, the thing here, though, is if you're, if you're selecting for amino acids or fatty acids at large, you might end up having a trade-off for sugar. Um, ultimately, that might decrease ethanol yield. But you also have secondary metabolites. So your cinnamic acids, the building blocks of lignin and lignan, carotenoids and pyrazines. Um, and these potentially are less likely to impact agronomic or ethanol yield. Actually, a 2020 report showed that um, cinnamic acids um, 
that there was a lot of variation, even in elite inbreds and their derived hybrids, um, high narrow sense heritability, but that the concentrations did not correlate with yield. Um, so I wanted to focus on cinnamic acids and their derived volatile phenols and styrenes for the second phase of my research. Um, one reason is like I just said, it might not impact yield. A second is that I, I think there's evidence to show that volatile phenols, especially um, are underrepresented in bourbon, especially as compared to rye whiskey. And one reason for this is that um, corn mash has, um, potentially has less dynamic acids than a rye mash. And that would be due to um, lower uh, lignin and lignan concentrations, potentially. Um, so uh, if you look at, this is just one table from, from one source, but lignan especially is elevated um, in rye grain as compared to corn. Now the degradation of both lignin and lignan um, due to uh, heating of the grain during mashing and distillation um, will cause them to break down and free cinnamic acids into your mash. And uh, once those cinnamic acids are present in the mash, they're now available for thermal degradation into volatile phenols and, ster and styrenes or also my microbial metabolism. Some yeast can actually metabolize these cinnamic acids into um, into volatile phenols and styrenes. Um, and I do think there's some evidence to show that volatile phenols are elevated in rye whiskey, both experimental and um, anecdotal evidence. So here's some experimental evidence showing um, four, or sorry, three volatile phenols and their concentrations in bourbon. Uh, one sample of bourbon, it's just one sample, but it's still, um, it's still an important, uh, place to kind of build this idea and then two different rye whiskeys and what you see is that these three volatile phenols are much more elevated in some cases especially much more elevated in rye whiskey as compared to bourbon it's important to remember that bourbon and rye whiskey in the united states must be aged in the same type of barrel um, and these are all going to be these samples that i'm showing you here this data all came from kentucky bourbon and kentucky rye whiskey so what we're looking at this variation um, it's probably due to um, the grain, um, potentially other aspects of fermentation, but not most likely due to maturation. So phase two was looking at variations and correlations of cinnamic acids in mash and beer um, and, their vol and their downstream volatile phenols and styrenes and new make bourbon. Uh, remember, these cinnamic acids, unlike the benzaldehyde from phase one, these cinnamic acids are not volatile. So we can't do that, that, um, that method that we used in phase one because we're not looking at volatile compounds. We're looking at non-volatile precursors, these cinnamic acids, the main two of which are ferulic acid and cumeric acid. Um, or those are the ones that I um, identified in this phase two. Um, so the questions, do these do the cinnamic acid concentrations in mash and beer vary among varieties? What about the volatile phenols and the styrenes? Do they vary as well? And then can we use cinnamic acids in mash and beer to predict to select for um, volatile phenols and styrenes in new make bourbon? Similar setup to phase one, except now I had four samples of corn um, with a little bit more diversity. Uh, uh, Clarkson grain and and um, Iowa provides some grain to the bourbon industry, and I uh, was able to acquire four different varieties that they that they um, sell: a red, a blue, a yellow, waxy, and a white. Process these four samples in triplicate into twelve mashes, which became twelve beers, which uh, through twelve distillations became twelve new make bourbon samples. Um, we looked at cinnamic acids in the mash and the beer, and looked at volatile phenols and styrenes in the new make bourbons. Um, so here's the variation I'm showing that this is a connecting letters report. These tables are um, the color indicates the letter. So red is a green is B and blue is C with red being the highest and C being the lowest concentration. Um, what we found was that ferulic acid in the mash uh, showed significant variation among the four varieties. Uh, cumeric did not in the mash, but in the beer, at least a 10% probability, cumeric acid did show significant variation um, among the four varieties. So then looking at the volatile phenols and styrene variation in new make bourbon, the new make bourbon samples, 
um, showing us a subset of a much bigger table from um, the actual dissertation. But here are um, five compounds that I want to look at really quick. So um, the ones with the stars next to them, ethyl gaiacol, vinyl gaiacol, and ethyl phenol, these were identified in my literature review as being very important for the flavor of bourbon. Um, and we see that they, um, they do show significant variation uh, at 5 and 10% for vinyl gaiacol, at least, um, among the four varieties. And uh, styrene with the star next, with, I'm sorry, with the diamond next to it. Remember, styrene from phase one was shown to correlate with both good aroma values and whiskey. And also benzaldehyde was a significant predictor of styrene concentration um, in new make whiskey. And again, we're seeing uh, for the styrenes, we didn't see significant variation, um, but we were able to draw some correlations. Now I get this is a small sample set, uh, there's only 12 samples here. My defense is that, uh, or my, my excuse is that it's just, it's very low throughput. And um, it still took me a few months to even do 12 samples. Um, but based on some papers, I found uh, an R value of at least 0.7. Um, is still is something to consider, um, even with this small sample set. Either way, styrene, we um, styrene and new make whiskey. So that's the concentration of styrene and new make is on the Y axis. And then on the X axis, we have um, the concentration of ferulic acid in the mash on the far left and then P cumeric acid in the mash on the far right. Um, and we're finding some, some negative correlations. It's interesting. Remember in phase one, benzaldehyde was a positive correlation um, with styrene. Um, so we then also alpha, alpha methyl styrene, close derivative styrene, again, negative correlation with now cumeric acid concentration in the beer. And then um, on the far right, for ethyl phenol, a very, again, one of the compounds from the table a few slides back with the star next to it, for ethyl phenol um, was predicted uh, with one outlier removed um, by cumeric acid in the beer. And cumeric acid is a, a direct precursor to ethyl phenol. Um, well, the last thing really quick, this, this study that I did, um, it really expanded beyond volatile phenols and cinnamic acids, but I'm still gathering a lot of that data. I'm actually gathering sensory data as well, working with collaborators at Virginia Tech. Um, that the paper we eventually published from this research will, will look at all compound classes, not just volatile phenols and the new make whiskey, but here's a table, a small subset of the data. Um, again, if there's a star next to the compound, it was identified in my literature review as being an important flavor compound in bourbon. And if there's a diamond next to it, it means that um, in phase one, that compound was impacted by terroir. And we're seeing a lot of interesting variations among the four varieties of corn. And I'm showing you these specifically because in phase one, I also identified these same compounds, but none of them were um, showed significant variation among the elite yellow hybrids. And some of these didn't even show variation among the environments. Whereas all of these compounds, all six of these compounds did show significant variation in this phase of my research, working with more diverse hybrids. So this idea that if we incorporate exotic germplasm into our breeding programs, might be able to really um, introduce more flavor diversity into the varieties that we're, uh, that we're breeding. And uh, the last thing here is just one more correlation I wanted to show you. So this is uh, on the y-axis, you have ethyl no nanoate concentration in new make whiskey. Now on the x-axis is a, um, an unknown compound in the mash identified. I'm not sure what it is yet, but this unknown compound in the mash uh, was a positive, uh, showed positive correlation with ethyl no nanoate. Now this is important because ethyl no nanoate was also identified in phase one. And if you remember back, it also correlated with the good aroma category, but benzaldehyde and corn did not show correlation with ethyl no nanoate in new make whiskey. So we didn't have a, a chemical marker for ethyl no nanoate from phase one, even though it was one that we're interested in because it showed correlation with the good aroma category. But now we're finding a potential chemical marker in the mash for ethyl no nanoate concentration in the new make whiskey. Um, so if we're looking at how we're going to breeding approaches for improving the flavor of our corn for whiskey, we can improve the yield of heirlooms without losing flavor. Um, 
you know, by, by having chemical markers, we can um, hopefully track and not lose flavor through, uh, through our breeding cycles. Um, a lot of ground that could potentially be made up just through recurrent selection of heirlooms. Um, you could self heirlooms to create inbred lines. Seth has done this with some of um, the old Texas heirlooms that are in the, uh, in the program. And one in particular is called Hillsboro blue and white that were, um, we actually just planted a lot of this, um, this heirloom at uh, Sawyer farms uh, a few days ago. Um, or you could improve the flavor of elite inbreds without losing yield. This might be the most, uh, in the short term, um, the most promising because in the end, like, you know, the heritage brands in Kentucky to TX whiskey, which is a very large distillery, we still have to consider agronomic yield, the cost of the grain. We can pay more than we do now than what the commodity prices are set to, but we still need to consider yield. It's still an important aspect of our, of our industry. So, um, but both approaches hold promise. Uh, so we answered some questions in phase two. Um, do cinnamic acid concentrations vary? Yes. Volatile phenols and styrenes, do they vary? Yes, as well as some other ones that are interesting, uh, especially due to um, phase one and how we're kind of connecting some of the data now. Um, and are there some correlations? Sample number was low. We need to do follow-up work to identify, uh, you know, have more confidence in our chemical markers, but I think we're on the right track. And uh, just want to acknowledge, you know, Seth for taking on a very atypical student. Um, I had a distance co-chair uh, here in Fort Worth, or uh, Dr. Eric Simonic, who is also the co-author on my first book, Shots of Knowledge, The Science of Whiskey. My committee members, um, Allie, who I've mentioned a lot already, was just critical in the phase one research. And um, she's now our head blender at TX Whiskey and is uh, just a great student. We, and we also just hired a year ago another Texas A&M graduate. So uh, I do think this, me joining this program has, I'm trying to cherry pick and whoever's available from Texas A&M that likes whiskey, trying to, trying to hire them now. Um, and I want to thank FNR, uh, which was the company's name before we were acquired by Pernod Ricard, who is our parent company now, but both, both companies um, provided the funding for this research. And um, that is all. Great job. Might I say an intoxicating presentation. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. Hey, I got a question for you. How's the yeah. baby pop? How's the, uh, they haven't given me any. So I'm in a quarantine hotel. So I've been, oh. I'm in, on, my wife and I are on day seven at the Grand Hyatt near the, near the airport. Um, can't leave the hotel room. Oh. And the food they're bringing is, uh, it's okay. Okay. Questions for Rob? Hi. Yes. I had one uh, question that I put in the chat, but I'll just say it. Did you look at the soil properties further, like categorizing the percent sand silt clay on top of the yield? I know it kind of looked at the map there. Yeah. Um, did you break that down any further? No. And I mean, it, it's something that we should look at and, and future studies. And um, it's something that the, the recent paper that came out a few weeks ago from Ireland in, in collaboration with Oregon State, they did look more at soil properties. Um, we were just, this was just kind of a starting point. And so yeah. that environmental effect could be anything, it could be soil, climate, agronomic mm -hmm. technique. It's probably mm -hmm. a combination. Um, yeah. But in wine, there's lots of data that dives into, you know, the the details of soil and how they can impact flavor and wine. And so, I, again, I think it's a nice roadmap for us to, to look at what they found and, and expand upon it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Robert, um, this, this, this is Eugene Derek. Uh, I enjoyed your talk. Once I noticed that you took a lot of uh, a lot of the good properties for your whiskey, I wondered that those uh, there are some properties may have some bad effects on the quality of your whiskey. Uh, well, I wonder if you have looked about the mycotoxins in the, in the, in the corn or right. the quality of your whiskey, and if you do have mycotoxins, what do you do with your product? Yeah, they're gonna. So those should break down um, 
especially during a distillation stage. But we we still we don't work with corn that has elevated levels or any grain of a mycotoxin, whether it's aflatoxin or vomitoxin. We we adhere to FDA regulations on that, even though we're not FDA regulated. Um, I haven't seen anything that's talked about how that could impact flavor. The only thing I've read about uh, elevated aflatoxin levels in corn and the impact on fermentation is that it can potentially stress the yeast. But I, I don't think there's a lot out there because we just, like the food industry, we, we just don't accept corn that has elevated levels. The, a big reason is that, you know, the, the byproduct of whiskey production is wet, dist wet distillers grains or dry distillers grains. They, we, we give all of our stillage to a, a big dairy farmer down in Dublin, Texas. Uh, we can't have aflatoxin in our, in our corn or else it ends up in the stillage. Okay, uh, related to this one. So could you give us some general idea? Roughly, when you sell uh, distillers grains, how much money you gain from those distillers, uh, distillers grains versus your whiskey? Or in, the, in general, for yeah. the ethanol like industry, how much also the percentage of the distiller, the money you made from the distillers grain? Okay, so we, we don't actually dry our byproducts. So we sell it as, a, as wet distillers grains or wet stillage, we call it we pay a farmer to haul it because it's like hauling water. So we don't make okay. anything on it. Now you can dry it and it can become a source of revenue, but it's, I think it's more about trying to break even on grain costs versus make money on it. Thank you. Other questions? A question regarding the, uh, the other chemicals that might have an impact. What, what did you find about phosphorus levels? Uh, and their impact on whiskey. It seems like one of the things that would vary the most in the seed would be phosphate levels, depending on phosphorus fertilization and uh, phosphorus availability mm. in the soil. Yeah, I mean, we really, really didn't dive into that. We, you know, the the only kind of analysis we did on the grain itself was GC mass spec of the volatiles. Um, on the milled grain and then, you know, in the mash and beer for phase two, we we're just looking at cinnamic acids. So we didn't get into, um, to that level of detail in the research. Um, it's something we should look at and something that, again, I'm not trying to always harp back to the wine industry, but they've looked at things like different, you know, di how different types of fertilizations do impact the flavor of their wines. Um, we're just, we're in the very beginning stages of this for whiskey. Thank you. Other questions? Go on once. I have, I have oh. a quick, quick question. Go ahead. Um, do you think there's a, any client, well, do you have any idea which climatic uh, components of the environment part might be involved? So I see that you spread your sites pretty widely north to south across the state. And I wondered if you had any, uh, any thoughts on that, insights on climatic conditions, diurnal temperature uh, variation or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, we chose uh, again, it's from the Texas Corn Performance Trials, so the sites were kind of locked in, but we definitely wanted to choose a variety of environments in Texas. Um, but we, you know, didn't get into the, the detail on that again. Um, so it really was just more about trying to uh, establish a baseline before we build upon it. But um, if you look at what uh, in wine, again, um, you really have four aspects here that are going to play a role in the flavor chemistry in the wine. And that's the temperature, the radiation or the sunlight availability, um, which is probably more important in grapes than in grains due to how uh, the berries actually receive direct sunlight. But um, nitrogen status, irrigation, water status, things like that. Um, it's something we should look at, but again, we just, we haven't looked at that and I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be able to speculate, to be honest, how, um, you know, how some of those very specifics can impact flavor chemistry at this point. 
Further questions? Go on. Okay, go ahead. I had a quick a quick question um, just related to when the four different um, corns that you looked at, I noticed one of them was a waxy, mm -hmm. which would be a, a high amylose. Amylopectin. The yeah. Um, so did you see any differences when you when you went through your general procedure for that and making that into a whiskey as far as how it went, you know, how it metabolized, how it went through its fermentation. I would, I would think there would be some differences there. Uh, it, it was definitely the one that was most amenable to, um, to sh sugar yield and also attenuation. So sugar, sugar use by the, the yeast compared to the other varieties. Um, it didn't look much different than the standard yellow dent hybrids from phase one. Um, but it is interesting from, uh, you know, these other, these, some of these, you know, especially the, the, cor the corns that have color that these heirlooms um, that seem to provide great, great flavor, a lot of times do provide lower yields. So whether it's, I'm talking about ethanol yield at that point. Right. Right. But um, I do think that's, one reason why, as we look at how we can breed and select for flavor, um, looking, you know, the idea of still maintaining yellow dent, uh, you know, elite hybrid corn is what we're, is what we're really going to still use in the industry, but how can we bring in some of the nice aspects of other, other varieties when it comes to flavor without losing the, you know, the agronomic gains that we've made over the decades in our elite hybrids and elite inbreds. Great. Thanks.